Good morning. Good morning. So last time we ran into a problem. We had Mendel, my hero Mendel, this MIT-like mathematical, physical monk, had developed this gorgeous theory of particles of inheritance. He didn't use the word gene yet. Gene doesn't get invented for much longer. Um, for every trait, you had two such particles. You gave one to your offspring. Each of the parents gave one to their offspring. And that's how each offspring gets two of them. Those, that choice of which of the two alleles to transmit to your offspring is a random draw. And that explains beautifully, for example, the three to one segregation pattern that Mendel saw. Gorgeous. Um, we put that model, which was an ex post facto model, a model made after the data were available, to a test. You guys insisted we had to test it before you would publish it. And uh, it holds up pretty well, making pretty surprising predictions that you would otherwise not have ever expected. Like amongst that three to one, the threes are not all the same. Some of those round Ps were homozygous for the big R allele. And in a selfing, they'll never produce wrinkled Ps. But two thirds of those round Ps were heterozygous. And when you self them, you get a quarter wrinkled Ps. So the wacky prediction that a third of the rounds will give rise to no wrinkles, and two thirds of the rounds will give rise to a quarter wrinkles is a surprising prediction, and therefore something that bears you know, stating as a scientific prediction. Um, and so all those kind of predictions can, can emerge. Then we turned to the question of two factors. And I'm, I'm practicing using our words here, right? Our homozygous, heterozygous alleles, et cetera. We now turn to two traits, two phenotypes. We have two phenotypes segregating. Um, we had round and wrinkled, and we had green and yellow. And Mendel determined rather brilliantly that they segregated or transmitted independently of each other. There was no correlation between which alleles you got at round and which alleles you got at wrinkled. That was pretty cool. Let's just go over that because there's a real tension to be resolved. Because we have Mendel's second law versus the chromosome theory. So Mendel's second law, let's just go back to it. In the F0 generation, we had our round green Ps, genotype, big R, big R, big G, big G. We had our wrinkled yellow Ps, genotype, little r, little r, little g, little g. We cross them together, we get F1 double heterozygotes, big R, little r, big G, little g. We then perform a back cross or a test cross to the doubly homozygous parent with the two recessive phenotypes. We're practicing our words here. And what do we get? Well, we get certain options. As we said, the gametes that emerge from this parent on the left could be of the following types. The gametes from the parent on the right are all those alleles. Are those recessive alleles? No, you'll forget this over time, but just to make me comfortable, they're actually the alleles associated with the recessive phenotype that we're talking about 
because you know, but we'll forget, I assure you, because all my colleagues in the biology department have forgotten, that they could also control multiple other phenotypes, some of which could be dominant. But that's okay. I forgive you in advance that you'll call them recessive alleles. Anyway, um, you get this, and then these should occur at equal frequency of 1 to 1 to 1 to 1. All right. Now, we had the chromosome theory. The chromosome theory, the observation of the choreography of chromosomes during meiosis, chromosomes in meiosis, looks like this. We have chromosomes lining up in pairs. Now, I'm not drawing it terribly well, but the pairs could be, the two members of each pair can be of, uh, are of the same size, but this pair could be bigger and this pair could be smaller. It looks like they're really finding each other. These chromosomes are visibly different in shape, and so maybe I'll make this guy a little longer just to indicate that, that it actually knows. Now, an explanation we said for how Mendel's second law of independent assortment of two different phenotypes could occur is that, for example, um, round, it could be that the gene for roundness is located on chromosome number one. These are two copies of chromosome one that have been duplicated, each of which has the big R allele. Next to it, two copies of chromosome one that have been duplicated, each of them having the little r allele. Over here, on chromosome number two, let's say, lies the gene for green or yellow. And in this picture here, the big G's are on the two copies of this chromosome number two that are here. The little G's are on the two copy of chromosome number two that are here. When the cell undergoes meiosis one, we get to the situation where we have big G, big G, little g, little g. We've got big R, big R, little r, little r. Could it have been the case that the big G was on the right and the little g was on the left? Yeah, of course. It's totally independent which way. I happen to draw it this way, but with probability 50%. It's the other way. That's why they're independent of each other. And then when it undergoes meiosis two, that looks just like mitosis, we end up with our four gametes here. Oops, sorry. Our four gametes with big G, big G, little G, little uh, little G, big R, big R little r, little r. And that accounts for the big G, big G, big, big r, big G, little r, little g gametes. And then when they went the other way, the organism would make a set of gametes that had the other combination of big r's with little g's. Okay, So that's, that's perfectly fine. And because it, the second chromosome is independently ordered compared to the first chromosome, when they line up at the midline, they don't really care which way they are, that'll account for one to one to one to one. It's so straightforward. But what happens? What happens if instead both big R, both the roundness gene and the greenness gene live on the same chromosome? We'll have little r, little r there. We'll have big G, big G here, little g, little g. And then when they split, we'll end up with 
Now, chromosome 2 has nothing that we care about on it. It has a lot of genes. In fact, there could be chromosomes 3, 4, 5. I'm just not drawing them. But we're only really going to focus on chromosome number 1 here. And you'll notice that here on chromosome 1, the big Gs, or the little Gs, are coupled, physically coupled to each other. The bigs with the bigs and the smalls with the smalls. So now, the kind of gametes that can emerge from this, the kind of gametes will only be big R, big G type, or big G type, or they'll be little r, little g type. We can't get the reverse combination. We can't get bigs and littles. So this, because these are independent of each other, will get us one to one to one to one. These are the big, little, and then these other combinations like that. This will get us only if we look at the big R, big G, little r, oops, big G, little r, little g, big R, little g, uh, little r, big g, will get us 1 to 1 to 0 to 0. Let's give a name to this type, the big R's and the little g's. Let's call that a recombinant type, OK? I'm just going to use that word for the moment. The recombinant types, the bigs and the littles and the littles and the bigs, we're not going to see any of them. This is a very strong difference between Mendel's second law and the chromosome theory. If the chromosome theory is right, and these, these chromosomes are physical entities that have integrity, they can't both be right. So that's a great thing in science, when you have two different models and they can't both be right, because you learn things then. You can test them. Now, Mendel, Mendel tested this without actually knowing the chromosome theory, and he always got one to one to one to one for the seven traits he looked at. Was he just lucky that they happened to lie on the seven different chromosomes? Or is there some problem with this chromosome theory, or what? It took, a it took a while. Now, of course, everybody forgot about Mendel from 1865 till the year 1900. In the year 1900, people begin to rediscover Mendel. Cytology has come along. In, in January of the year 1900, people start rediscovering. Plant breeders start rediscovering Mendel, OK? Um, so, oh, sorry, thank you. See you ready. Thank you. Um, I can tell by the look on your face that something must be wrong there. Good. Um, plant breeders start rediscovering Mendel. And uh, in January of 1900, three different groups say, you know, we found these laws, and they're just like Mendel's laws, which now everybody starts paying attention to. But plant breeding, and people tried to do mice, and people tried to do rats. What turned out to be the winner, the place to really study genetics, was the fruit fly. Thomas Hunt Morgan at Columbia University decided, after he was really frustrated wasting years breeding mice and rats that just took too long, around 1900, oh, I don't know, 1906 or something like that, began to start breeding fruit flies. Fruit flies are the teeny little flies that, you know, when you open a banana, they, you'll, you'll find fruit or fruits or other kinds of things, you'll see them. And Studying Drosophila gave us the answer to this question of what the problem is. How can it be that either it's independent or totally dependent? So we're going to talk about Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, and the discovery of recombination. So now, Morgan. I'm going to now start using fruit fly notation to give you some practice with fruit fly notation. 
Fruit flies, we're not going to use big G's and little g's. They like to refer to the normal allele and the mutant allele. The normal allele is plus. The mutant allele gets some kind of a name. And so he had a female fly that was normal and normal at two different loci, two different genes. I haven't told you what the genes are. And the male fly had a black colored body, black across its whole body, and its wings were shriveled and therefore called vestigial. So the phenotype here is black and vestigial. Black body, vestigial wings. And this wasn't the normal appearance of a fly. So he took these females by these males and he crossed them together and he got an F1. And the F1 was black over vestigial, plus over plus. And what was their phenotype? Were they normal appearance, which is a light, which is kind of a sandy colored body and normal wings? Or were they this all black body and vestigial wings? Turns out they were normal. From that, what do we infer about these two traits, black body and vestigial wings? They're recessive traits. So the, here, the phenotype was normal. Oops. Normal appearance. So then he crosses them back, doing a test cross. Let's say he'll take males here and females here, but it actually works either way. And what he does is just like we did there, he could get gametes that were, that were black vestigial. He could get gametes that were black plus, plus vestigial, or black, or, or plus plus. Those are the four possibilities that come out. So when he does it, let's keep score. I'm going to write them now, plus, plus, black vestigial. And from the other parent, you got this, black plus, black vestigial, plus vestigial, black vestigial. Those are the four possibilities. And if this was just like Mendel's traits, it would be one to one to one to one. These were the parental types that went in. Plus plus went in, and black vestigial went in. Those were the combinations of traits here. These were new combinations. What he observed, let's see. If Mendel's right, it'll be one to one to one to one. If the chromosome theory is right, it'll be one to one to zero to zero. And who was right? No one. The answer was 965 to 944 to 206 to 185. Neither model is right. Neither model is right. The new combinations, the recombinant combinations, the non-parental combinations, we can call these recombinant combinations. These were recombinant. They recombined in some way. They were a new combination. Or they were the non-parental types. We use both of those words frequently. Were neither equal, nor were they completely absent. They occurred, but at a lower frequency. What was the frequency? Well, we could just add it up. The frequency of recombinant types of new types that were different than the parents is 17 percent. What's going on? Now, maybe this is some magic number, like you know the 3 to 1 ratio. And you should look at that 17 percent and say, ah, this is some constant of the universe, that when you put in traits, you get 17 percent of recombinant types. But it takes a little judgment to say, I don't think so. And he actually tried other traits. And sometimes he got once, 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 one. But very often, he got some funny number. 6 percent, 28 percent, 1 percent. 
there was some funny business going on. What's going on? Recombination. That's what's going on, is there is recombination occurring. What do we mean by recombination? Recombination is very important stuff, by the way. At some point, I will tell you that understanding recombination was actually the origin of the Human Genome Project. And it traces back to a good MIT story, but that will be for a little later in the semester. So what do we think is happening here? What we think is happening is, I'm now going to draw a close-up of that chromosome. And here's another chromosome, the other pair. And what we think here might be happening is that you might have plus and black, black and plus, this, uh, sorry, uh, black, right? Uh, black, black, plus, plus. This will be plus. This will be plus. This is the normal chromosome. This is plus. So this chromosome here carries the pluses. This guy here carries those alleles, black and vestigial, right? Well, what happens? the idea was, was that somehow these chromosomes exchange material here. And the chromosome that was plus, 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 now somehow acquires that bit. And this chromosome somehow gets that bit. And we end up instead with a picture like this where some of this came from here. And those two loci, black and vestigial, were separated from each other such that the black allele moves over to that chromosome. Is that clear? That's the notion. Why did they think this was true? Well, it turns out that in fruit flies, you can actually look at eggs under the microscope, and you can look at the chromosomes. And if you, take, if you take the cells and you take a cover slip and you squash it down with your finger, you can actually see chromosomes lying right over each other, making little crosses like I drew there, up there, called chiasmata, which means crosses. And so people said, see, in the microscope, you can see they're lying on top of each other. Are you impressed by that piece of evidence? No. You took the cover slip, you squished it down with your fingers, so they're lying on top of each other. Big deal. I'm not going to be impressed, and calling it chiasmata doesn't make me any more impressed, right? Although it's always good to call things Greek names because people think they're more sophisticated if you call them Greek names. But this was the notion people had. And the frequency, 17%, would indicate how, f you know, how often these, these crossovers occur. But if I were, like, in this situation we talked about Mendel, I wrote this up, and I said, see, it's 17% sometimes, 6% sometimes, 28% sometimes. And when I look in the microscope, they lie on top of each other. Therefore, it's recombination. There were actually other ideas floating around, too. Maybe it has something to do with developmental biology. Maybe, you know. It was a puzzle. When you have a really deep puzzle, the most important thing in science is to find a young person. Because young people come without prejudice. They kind of say, let me just look at all of this, stand back, I don't come with any prejudice. So at MIT, what is the solution when you have a problem like this? A Europe. You want a Europe. So even in 1911, that was the solution at Columbia. Thomas Hunt Morgan got a Urop. I'm serious. He was called Alfred Sturdivant. Alfred Sturdivant was a sophomore at Columbia. Everybody else was busy finding this recombination data. 
how often this recombined with this, this with this, this with this. Sturdivant, he's a sophomore, he says, God, this stuff's interesting. Professor Morgan, could I have all the data and try to look at it? Sturdivant took it home and actually pulled an all-nighter, blew off his homework. It actually says so in his autobiography. He says, I blew off my homework and pulled an all-nighter. Um, essentially in those words, he says, to the detriment of my undergraduate homework, is the way he puts it. Um, but in any case, Sturdivant's all-nighter. Genetic maps and Sturdivant's all-nighter. What Sturdivant did was the following. He said, how are we going to prove the chromosome theory? I like this idea that recombination is about distance on the chromosomes. Right? I like the concept that maybe 17% is how often these things recombine. Why would things only recombine 1% of the time? What would that mean? they got to be pretty close together so that a crossover between them happens not so often. And what if things were far apart? Well, it could be more likely. So he likes the idea that recombination frequency means distance. But how are you going to prove that? It could mean a zillion other things. It could mean biochemical pathways, developmental biology. How are you going to prove that recombination frequency means distance? You've got to make predictions, right? The only way to do it would be to make predictions. So Sturdivant takes the data and he starts making predictions. I think, says Sturdivant, these things are alleles living at genes with locations on the chromosome. Black, vestigial. How often do black and vestigial, vestigial recombine with each other? What is the frequency of recombinant non-parental types? 17%. So Sturdivant goes through the data and he says, what about other crosses people did in the lab? Well, it turns out people did crosses with another mutant that produces a funny eye color called cinnabar, CN. So cinnabar. It turns out that the recombination frequency, the recombination frequency between cinnabar to vestigial was 8%. Vestigial cinnabar, 8% recombination. If this chromosome business is right, where should I put cinnabar? Sorry? Where, where do you want it? Somewhere in between. You'd like me to put that there. Oh, OK, wait a second. On the other side. OK, which is it? How many vote for the left? How many vote for the right? How many conscientious abstainers are there? OK. Do we know? No, there are two possibilities. It could be 8% this way or it could be 8% that way. How are we going to know? Yes. Black. What if we knew the answer between cinnabar and black? That would constrain the problem. Can you give me two predictions for what the answer might be? Either 9% if it was, or 25. So now we have a prediction. We don't know where cinnabar is, but the answer could be, that black to vestigial should either be about 9%, right? That's what that would be here, or about 25%. The answer? About 9%. That's what Sturdivant found. That's a prediction and kind of cool. And you can imagine, you know, taking the data home and you know it's probably 9 o'clock and you now realize, wow, freaky, it's 9%. So then he looked at 
he looked at the mutation lobe. Lobe was another mutation. The lobe mutation showed 5% recombination from vestigial. Where should we put it? Left or right? Well, let's make some predictions. Suppose it's over here. Will it be very close to cinnabar? Will it be closer to black? Then, but what if it was over here? Well, it would be further. So let's put lobe in. And suppose we know that lobe is 5%. Then what's the prediction for black to lobe? 22%. Answer, according to the notebooks, 21%. Pretty close. You'd like it to be exactly 22, but life doesn't always turn out that way. 21 is pretty close to 22. What other predictions could we make? If this is cinnabar here, can you give me a prediction for cinnabar to lobe? 13%. Yep, that works. Curved wing. Recombination distance from lobed, 3%. So now you have some predictions. You have this prediction here. You predict 8%. Answer, about 8%. Over here, you predict 16%. Answer, about 16%. Bingo. Sturdivant says, if these genes, we call them loci often, I'll use the word locus, synonymous with gene. Locus means a place. And geneticists think about genes as a place on a chromosome. If these loci, the plural of locus, if these loci were really arrayed along a linear structure, then it would have to be the case that they would have certain additive relationships between them. And the chance that they would have these additive relationships if they weren't part of a line is pretty implausible. That's a real prediction. A very remarkable prediction, and it holds up with the data. Sturdivant pulls the all-nighter. By the time the sun comes up at Columbia University, this is Morningside Heights, he's got the whole thing worked out. Yes, this chromosome theory must be right. It fits beautifully all of these data. Pretty cool. You are all authorized to blow off your homework any time you make a discovery like that. OK? <laughs> That's a course rule. Any homework, homework will be forgiven for discoveries of that magnitude. Um, all right. Tell your TAs. So now, what does it really tell us? It tells us that if genes are very close together, the recombination frequency, R recombination frequency, or RF, might be very little. They could be as low as almost zero, which means you never see a recombinant, because they're right next to each other. Or it could be that they're further apart. It might be 1%. It might be 10%. It could keep growing. It might be 30%. Suppose it's way, 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 way far away. What's the largest it ever gets to be? Well, if they're on different chromosomes, suppose they were totally independent segregation, different chromosomes, what would they be? No, it's 50%. Because remember, 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 says that the recombinant size, well, actually, an interesting question. Let's come to that 100. They're on different chromosomes, 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, means that it's 50%. Half of them are recombinant types. It turns out on the same chromosome, as you get farther and farther and farther, you might say there's going to be a 100% chance of a crossover. And you might say the recombination frequency could keep growing past 50%. It turns out it doesn't. The reason is that multiple crossovers can happen. So mathematical interjection here. If here's my gene and here's my gene, there could be one crossover. There could be 
two crossovers. There could be three crossovers. And so in fact, it turns out as you get very far away, you have to start paying attention to the probabilities of double crossovers and triple crossovers. And so it turns out that it's a Poisson process of the number of crossovers that occurs, give or take. And you see a recombination if there's an odd number. And for that reason, it never gets above 50%. So as the distance gets further and further and further, it goes from 0 to 50, which is the same number you get for separate chromosomes. Otherwise, you might think that if there was just one crossover, it gets to 100% probability of recombination, but it never does because there are doubles. And you can actually observe. If you make a cross that has three different genes segregating in it, you can actually see the double crossover type. So you can see very nicely that if you make a cross involving black cinnabar and vestigial over plus, 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 you can see that cinnabar is right in the middle because this recombination happens at a pretty good frequency. This recombination happens at a good frequency, giving you plus cinnabar vestigial or black plus plus. Sometimes you will get that recombination. You'll get out gametes that are black plus vestigial, but at a much lower frequency because they take two crossovers. What will be the probability of seeing a black cinnabar vestigial? Well, we said that this one was about 9%. This one was about 8%. What's the product of a 9% chance and an 8% chance? It's about a 1% chance, a little less than a 1% chance. That's how frequently you see black plus vestigial. You can even predict the probability of a double crossover event by multiplying the two events that have to happen. So your bottom line rules here is that because of these double crossovers, recombination frequency can go from 0 to about 50%. This is independent assortment. And it either occurs if you're on different chromosomes or if you're very far away on the same chromosome. They behave as if they're independent of each other. Any questions about any of that? Yes? Why didn't Mendel ever see recombination? Turns out that with seven chromosomes and they're big-ish in length, he never actually ran into two loci that were close enough to notice it. That's why. Phi's actually only have three major chromosomes. There's a fourth, but it's a puny little thing. Um, and because they were much more intensively collecting mutations in Morgan's fly room, they began having a lot of them, and they had to bump into recombination pretty early. Morgan simply, uh, Mendel simply didn't have enough that were close enough. Think about what would have happened if just by chance somebody were selling a strain of peas in the market which had a mutation in a locus that had 10% recombination distance and it screwed up Mendel's law of independent assortment of two loci. Mendel might not have published the paper. Sometimes in science it's actually valuable to first get the oversimplification out, like his second law, and then deal with the complexity that sits on top of the oversimplification. It's kind of lucky that Mendel didn't have enough of them to be bothered in the first paper. But it's, and so in fact, all of, the, all of Mendel's seven loci have now been mapped. Most have been cloned molecularly. And so we actually know where they are, et cetera. It's a really good question. That's sort of why he didn't. 